PhotoShelter is the leader in online portfolio websites and tools for professional photographers. We help you get business, do business, and keep business. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi from the PhotoShelter headquarters here in New York City. We have a great webinar for you today if you're into fashion photography with uh, two great educators and photographers, Melissa Rodwell and Dana Pennington. Before we get to them, a few housekeeping notes. Over to the right of your computer, you should see a GoToWebinar control panel, and from that panel, you can ask us questions as we move along. I would also encourage you to tweet at us, at PhotoShelter and at Join the Breed. So if you have any questions you want to pop at us, you have two ways to get in touch with us. We're going to incorporate those questions into the conversation as we move along. Um, and with that, let me introduce to you our two special speakers, Melissa Rodwell and Dana Pennington. Hey, guys. Hi. How's it going? <laughs> so Breed was started a few years ago. It's sort of the fashion uh, resource for fashion photography. Uh, Melissa, can you tell us a little bit about why you founded it? Sure. I, um, I had had a, owned a blog for five years and with another partner, and uh, I wanted to sort of up the game, step it up a notch, and so I uh, had met Marius Troy during Fashion Week actually two years ago. I think it was two years ago, and um, we sort of just started talking roughly about it, and then about six months later, decided to to start Breed um, and take what I had done with my other blog and and turn it into like the the ultimate resource for emerging and aspiring fashion photographers. You're you're kind of uh, you're pretty internet savvy in that respect, having the blog for so many years and and then putting together this as a, a community uh, and a resource. What what sort of led you to embrace the internet so so much? Oh yeah, that wasn't me. I can't take credit for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, um, my ex. Uh, I my the blog was started by my ex husband and really the credit goes to him because he had the insight and fortitude to know that this was uh, the the new age of um, sort of marketing yourself and just getting your name out there and exposure plus there was just no fashion photography educational websites on on the internet <clears throat> so so uh, David Schuyler you know started the blog and then from there I you know we parted ways and then I started Breed with Marius, and we took we wanted to take what I had done with the blog to a whole different level, higher level, and um, more of a community feeling, and just you know embrace all aspects of of the business of fashion photography. So jointhebreed.com is the website. We have a special for all of the listeners here uh, on the on the uh, webinar today. If you go to jointhebreed.com slash photoshelter, you have two options. The first is if you sign up for a newsletter right now during this uh, webinar, we're going to select one of the people who enter their email to get a free annual membership. Uh, and we have Dana Pennington who's going to tell you a little bit more about what's in that membership. Hey, Dana. How's it going, everybody? Um, so basically, the one-year membership gets you access to all of our premium content. Uh, what that includes is tutorials, um, premiere articles, behind the scenes on photo shoots with various photographers, and just an endless amount of insight. Uh, it also gains you access to our, our community. Uh, we're building up sort of a, an online hub for people that are working in the industry and people that want to work in the industry. So it's a great social resource to connect with other like-minded individuals. So I see a guy named Fred has entered his email address into the comment window, but Fred, you need to go to jointhebreed.com slash photoshelter and put your email in over there if you want to be entered for that getaway, the giveaway. We also have a, a $50 off annual membership there if you go to that page, jointhebreed.com slash photoshelter. Melissa, you've been in the industry for many, many years. You're a regular contributor to a, a little magazine called Harper's Bazaar. You've shot commercial campaigns for Ralph Lauren, Nike, Coca-Cola, Honda, et cetera, et cetera. How, what, what brought you into the fashion industry in the first place? Uh, well, I wanted to be in the fashion industry on some level when I was really young. I think I started looking at Vogue and Harper's from about the age of 9 or 10, and I wasn't sure what aspect I wanted to go into, whether it was design or marketing, merchandising, wasn't sure. And I was in Europe when I was 17, and I accidentally stumbled into a photo gallery in Paris. 
and I saw these prints of uh, Helmut Newton and Guy Bourdin, David Bailey. It was like a group show, of fashion photographers there, and that was it for me. It was um, transformative, and I went home and asked my dad to borrow his Canon AE-1, and that's when it started. That was 1980, so that was 34 years ago. It's funny to me how many people were sort of inspired by the Canon AE-1 as their first, their first yeah, film that camera. Was sort of that was the like film yeah. camera to use back in those days. Yeah, that's right. You know, when and, when you mention Newton and some other of the, of the greats, when when I think of sort of the evolution of fashion photography, how it went from kind of one light, seamless background to now, you know, the first image of yours that we looked at, big set, high production, multiple multiple light sources, even though they're not necessarily in the key light, they're part of the ambient. When when you think about fashion photography, where do you th how do you place kind of the single light approach versus kind of the the big environmental approach? Well, I've always been a fan of the less is more. I've always been a, a big advocate of using just one light source. I I don't really overlight my my shoots and the shot I think that you're referring to the girl in the chapel. Yeah, it's actually it's just um, I mean there's ambient light and there's li like side light through the window, but basically that's just ambient light. I didn't even use strobe on that shoot. Oh wow! It's candle light and then a big light source um, in front of her. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I, I mean there's a lot of photographers that use you know a lot of lighting and and but I'm not one of those. I, I always use both. As little lighting as I can, and and sometimes not even strobe lighting. I'll use um, you know ambient light, projectors, flashlights, window light, whatever I can. We were talking before the webinar started about the new Profoto B1, and it kind of brings us on the on the the topic of gear. There are so many options for every photographer nowadays, from these medium format backs that have 50, 60, 80 megapixels, and yeah. Every sort of lighting contraption that you can, from a few hundred to tens of thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. for the for the aspiring fashion photographer, what sort of gear is sort of the minimum requirement for for having entry into the industry? When you're just starting out, yeah. I mean, a, a camera with a decent amount of pixels is good to start with, and I would say the thing that you would want to invest in the most is in your your lenses. The glass is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a big fan of fixed lenses as opposed to the zooms, and uh, you know, a really good 85 millimeter and uh, maybe a 50 and a 105 and can get you on your way. You don't need a lot of pixels if you're just going to be if your images are just going to be on the the internet on the web. Yeah. You know, unless you're doing billboards, you don't really need 80, 80, 80 megapixels. I, I, I don't, I've never had a need for that, but, uh, you know, I'm sure other, you know, some people think size is more and better and all that, but I, I don't, I'm not that person. <laughs> I, um, I shot for years on like, you know, the, the Nikon D1X, I don't even remember what it was, it was really low in pixels. And yeah. I, I was happy with it, you know, but, um, I now have a, Nikon D800, which I think is, I don't even know. Yeah, this 34? is a 36 megapixel. 30, 36, yeah. yeah. And it's just a lot. It's a lot to store, you know. I mean, I shoot mostly editorial, or the advertising is usually just print campaign. Some of it's blown up to do in store or, or billboard, but very rarely. And then we can just, you know, rent cameras for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Dana, we had talked about renting packs as you need them because it doesn't make sense to spend $10,000. Mm -hmm. On a pro photo pack, is that is that the the advice you would give to most photographers? Yeah, I would say you know as you're starting out, especially when you're starting to build your portfolio, don't sink a ton of money into stuff. Um, the big thing is just starting to shoot a lot, and really all you need is a camera and a lens and some ideas. Um, you know, you, there's so many rental houses and stuff like that. So if you find that you do need equipment. There's you, you pretty much have a resource, but I, I definitely wouldn't recommend dumping you know ten grand in gear just to get your you know start getting your feet wet. Melissa, you contributed to uh, one of our guides uh, entitled "Breaking into Fashion Photography," and you talked about approaching uh, modeling agencies to do test shoots. But even before you get to the level where you have a book, how did you 
get photos of people that looked like models or maybe who were not professional models, but how do you even start? Do you go to a website like Model Mayhem? Do you put out a classified and said, hey, I'm an aspiring photographer and I want to build a book? Well, you know, you have to remember I started in 1980, so we didn't have the internet. Back then the model <laughs> I mean, I started by shooting friends that were attractive and that looked like mo looked like models. Friends I met at, at parties or girlfriends of friends from my boyfriend. I mean, like it was just a matter of finding people that I thought were attractive enough and shooting them and building a book that way, and then finally having enough images to go into the modeling agencies. I mean, back then you had to make an appointment and you went in and you met with the agency bookers and owners. So um, it was a lot different back then. And, um, the first time I went to see a modeling agency, I went to Nina Blanchard at Hollywood and Highland here in Los Angeles, and my book was 16 by 20. Back then, it was mm -hmm. the rage to have huge prints. And, um, you know, that's how I got my foot in the door, was just going in, showing my book, and then they would start letting me use their models. I also went to Art Center College of Design, and we had fashion classes there where they would bring in professional models, so we could network that way, and then like shoot them in class and then take those pictures and show them to the agencies that they were represented with in Los Angeles and um, you know build up a reputation that way and start to use their other models. And when you start off and you're shooting friends, are you concerned with having a makeup artist on set or a stylist on set or is it basically, hey, we're doing it sort of au naturel, come as you would normally show up to a party or whatnot? Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in Hollywood, and uh, I, I was going to see bands from about from the time I had a driver's license, and I met a lot of people that were at clubs and parties, and so, yeah, there were lots of girls that had great clothes and could do their makeup pretty cool, and that's, that's how we started. Just bring your own clothes, do your own makeup, and let's shoot on a cool location. And that, that was the beginning. I didn't even know how to light. I didn't really learn how to light until I started at Art Center. Yeah. And then it took me, you know, a good year and a half, two years of intensive lighting classes to really understand light and how to light a model. And Dana, as someone who is of the internet age, how did you go about finding models when you were first starting out? Uh, when I was first starting out, I was actually in college studying photojournalism, um, and I kind of just wanted to start taking pictures of people as a, more of a creative challenge. So I asked my girlfriend and girls in the classes that I was taking and stuff like that and started just taking portraits essentially and then eventually you know I signed up on Model Mayhem and kind of worked my way up from there and eventually you know approached some of the agencies as I was starting to travel to the bigger markets because I actually I grew up in Denver and there's a couple of agencies there but they're much smaller um, it wasn't until I started coming out here to Los Angeles or Miami or New York that I started working with really good models mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and how would you describe the difference between kind of a, a mediocre model and a and a good model? It, beyond just obviously, you know, some people look very good on on film, but but clearly there's aspects of posing and, and awareness that that must factor into that. Yeah, for me, um, being tall and skinny is certainly important for a model. But the big thing for me is creativity. You know, if you're only getting the same five poses over and over again, it's going to be a really boring shoot. Uh, mm -hmm. So I feel like a good model is somebody who is actually creative themselves and you can you can watch a really good model work and she'll try different things and, and not every frame is going to work but you can tell that she's working something out in her head and trying and experimenting and eventually you're going to get that one shot that's really cool. Melissa, you work with top flight models now um, but you've worked with all variety of models. What what level of interaction are you having with them? Are you are you directing them on set, or do they basically know what they they need to be doing? I explain to them what I'm going after before we we get on set, and maybe I might show them some visuals and describe to them sort of what I'm going for, and then um, I might guide them throughout throughout the shoot. You know, um, maybe you know pull on the garment this way or, or move so that the, the skirt flows this other way. But, um, you know, the, the higher up girls you use, the, the, they really get it instinctively. They just yeah. know how to move. I mean, that's for me, aside obviously what from Dana said, you know, having the, the body requirements to be a model, 
it's the ability to emote and be comfortable in their bodies where they, they really move. Um, and I don't mean just like, you know, jumping up and down all the time. It's just that they, they know how to pose and they know how to bring emotion to, to, the, to the camera. Because that's where the magic is. That's what you capture. That interaction between photographer and model and the emotion going on. I've so, but tried. I can show them like that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I try to show them or to explain to them what I what the mood I am going for, and then we'll maybe work together throughout the shoot to, to achieve that. Um, I I've so dabbled. I think like say? all photographers try to try to do some fashion or beauty photography. Um, and when I was first starting, there was no makeup artist with me, and in future shoots I had a makeup artist, which obviously makes kind of a huge difference in, 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 in even, you know, things like how, how well the hair is styled. If someone's really going to be serious about their photography and, and put together a book, is that sort of a requirement to have a stylist yes. and a makeup artist nowadays? Yes. Yeah. It's absolutely important. Yep. Um, and I guess with digital, with, with the resolution that we're talking about, every little pore you can really see. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, let's see. There's a question from Mark about the differences between the approach you take with menswear versus women's wear fashion. Um, and are there, what sort of niches of fashion photography exist and, and what do people need to be aware of when they're entering this field? Okay, well the first part, the first question, the first part to the, well the first answer to the first part is there is real no different approach to shooting men's fashion or women's fashions for me. Um, my job is to make the fashion look, the clothing look as amazing as possible. So I have to light the garment. Um, and so we see texture and the tooth of the fabric and whatever elements of that garment the, the, the designer or the manufacturer wants to showcase. So there's real no difference, you know, men's fashion, women's fashion, it's, it's, it's the business of shooting fashion and I have to make the clothing look amazing. Um, I don't, what was the second part of the question? Uh, so I guess, uh, are, there, are there kind of different niches that you're finding beyond just men's and women's that, that people could go into or explore? I don't understand. I don't understand. Do you understand that question? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there's, fashion is, you know, like if you look at fashion in a broad scope, there are so many different avenues. You've got men's wear, you've got women's wear, you have really high fashion stuff, you've got more casual things. Um, and some people really kind of stick to certain, you know, certain genres. Um, you know, you don't really see people like Stephen Mizell shooting, uh, you know, jeans okay. and t-shirts. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so it's, a lot of it is about what you like and, and you know, what style, because I'm not saying that one thing is better or any, you know, any more viable than the other. Uh, a lot of it is just your personal preference. When, when you guys are doing personal type work versus commissioned editorial work or commercial work, are you going out and finding friends to work for free or do you throw together a little budget to, to do shoots like that? Oh. Or do you I even like still to do shoot that? Musicians and interesting. Yeah. I do occasionally, yeah. I like to shoot musicians and interesting looking people as portraiture. So um, if it's a broke musician who needs a hundred bucks, I, you know, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. He's asking and I really want to shoot him. Otherwise, a lot of times it's free. They're happy to have my photographs in their life. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I recently had that. I did. I was doing a fashion editorial, and I and I, I had two fashion professional fashion model girls, and I wanted um, a, the real thing, a real deal musician. And you know, he's a broke kid, living like ten kids in an apartment, and they're all trying to feed themselves and play play their music at nightclubs at night. So, yeah, I gave him a hundred bucks for that. Normally, I, I I wouldn't have to if he was an agency signed model, but I did because he's. I understand. It's not yeah. what he really wants to do, and. You know, I, I, I had to sort of beg him to do the shoot, so, yeah. And Dana, what about you? Here's a really cool, cool rocker dude photo. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, um, as somebody who is 
kind of trying to break through the industry. Um, a lot of the things that I'm shooting, um, I'm either shooting for my book or I'm shooting it with the intention to submit to a publication. So I don't have a budget up front. Um, and a lot of times for me it's, you know, I'll approach a stylist that I work with um, and say, you know, hey, I have this idea for a shoot. And then we go through and we find the model that fits the, fits the look and a makeup artist and we go from there without a budget. Um, but when I do have, you know, some extra resources to put into it, to a shoot, the one thing that I usually try to go for is just better styling. Um, if there's one thing that I would pay for, usually it would be to get, you know, a, a really top-notch stylist. Um, but as you're building your book, you kind of have to look at it as an investment. Um, and if, you, if you've got some, some spare money to dump into it, it's certainly worthwhile to do. Everybody's asking about the best way to approach agencies to get access to models and I know Melissa you wrote about this do you, do you want to start on that how you would do that today uh, I think Dana would answer that better because uh, it's been so long my information I think is a bit dated but okay. Dana recently you know sort of what went through school and you've just in the last three or four years right Dana you just started yeah. working in agencies yeah for me like I said earlier um, I grew up in Denver and uh, I started taking you know, on my vacations and stuff like that, I would come out here to Los Angeles or I would fly to Miami or New York for a week. And what I did, and this was just my approach, was before I came out, started coming out, I would, I went through and got the phone number for every single agency in Los Angeles and I called every single one of them. And I, the first time I came out, I think the only agency that even responded to me was Next. And uh, they, you know, I sent them my website, the work that I had built, you know, back home and they saw some potential in it and were like, okay, yeah, you can test with some of our new faces. Um, and that's generally where everybody starts is um, most of the agencies will have a new faces board and they're typically girls that are you know, 16, 17, 18. They, it might be their first photo shoot or their third photo shoot, um, but they, need, they desperately need pictures and you desperately need models. So it's kind of a symbiotic relationship. Um, and from there, I just, as I progressed, I just, kept contacting different agencies and eventually um, as I started getting a little bit better they all sort of jumped on board. Do you, do you ever approach anyone on the street or is that totally cliche and, and creepy in the in the internet age? Um, I haven't. Uh -huh. <laughs> Melissa, you're so, you're so chill Melissa, you'll go up to anyone. Well, yeah, I mean if it feels right. Yeah, it's, I think it's easier for a woman to approach a young girl than it would be a guy to approach a young girl too. Yeah, but yeah. like I always like phrase it with, "I'm a professional photographer. You can go to my website. Um, you know, I think you have potential. Do you, I always ask, are you a model? Blah blah blah. But yeah, I'll do that. I have, I have done that. Yep. Um, we have a few questions in regards to shooting in a location like the photos we're seeing versus shooting in a studio from the perspective of an agency or a publication in building your book does it does it make a difference or do you need to have both uh, well again like Dana was talking about you need to develop a, a style you need to figure out which which way you want to sort of go with this that with fashion photography and with your career um, I mean, you can be known as a really strong studio shooter, but I think I think it's both, isn't it, Dana? You really probably need to have both location and studio. Or I mean, you could you could market yourself as just a really strong sh studio shooter, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there are some people that you know dominate one area or the other. Like I, I personally don't really like shooting in the studio, but I do have I keep a few studio things in the book just to show people that I am capable of doing it. Uh, but I think the bigger bigger picture is finding a style that really suits you. Um, what sort of opportunities exist for being published? Obviously there's a lot of online magazines, there are a lot of tiny boutique -y magazines that you find on specialty news newsstands. Um, what, what should the emerging photographer, what sort of opportunities should they be looking for and where can they find them nowadays? Well, the, the best part about being published is it gets your name out there. It's like free advertising. So, you know, people pick up a copy of, uh, you know, Glass Book and they see 
my name in it. They like the story and they like my name on it, name in it. Or they see my name in it and they go to my website and I, I can get work from it. Um, I and mean, that's how we start out, it's by getting published and getting our name out there and becoming, and also that makes us look good when we have that, that work in our portfolios for advertising clients to see that we've been published and that we know how to do a story, we know how to do eight, an eight page story or put a story together and shoot it and make, mm -hmm. have it make sense, you know? So from a marketing aspect, it's, it's very important to be published. And, and yes, there are a lot, and now with the internet, there's just so many online magazines. Uh, not, not a lot, not all of them are really, you know, really great. So you sort of want to focus on the ones that have um, a large audience, that have a higher circulation, or I don't know how that's said in the internet, Dana. That's like, there's a lot of views. Go for the ones audience. with the most followers. There you <laughs> right. go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Dana, are there certain uh, print and online publications that you think uh, editors and, and photo buyers are looking at for fashion? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the popular websites and the popular, you know, small publications, everybody's kind of clicking on them. That one thing that I really like about being a photographer in this day and age is that uh, so many people are constantly online uh, just shooting for a website or even a print version for someone like Seaheads, which is based, I think, in the Netherlands or somewhere in Europe. Um, it's going to get you a, a fair amount of exposure. Um, and so much content you know, gets regurgitated, whether it's being reblogged on Tumblr or being on the Explore page on Instagram. Um, it's just the more eyes, the better. Um, so. Like if I'm shooting an editorial with the intentions of submitting it, first I look at which websites or which publications it, it fits with um, aesthetically, and then beyond that I go for you know which ones have a better reputation and which ones you know I, I look at what other photographers are shooting for these magazines and websites, and if it's entirely comprised of people that I've never heard of, it may or may not be the best choice. Um, but if it's somewhere. So, you know, somewhere that I, you know, I write, I'm recognizing half of the people's names that I see because it's not a huge industry. Um, yeah. I usually can can bet that it's um, a decent bet, and you're going to get a fair amount of exposure from it. What are some of your favorite websites for fashion? Um, as far as for exclusive content, uh, Fashion Gone Rogue is is really awesome. They do their own exclusive editorials. They also feature editorials and campaigns from the big publications, um, which is really cool. So it's a it's a great place to just go and look at work. Um, they also have a huge following. Um, I shoot for Sea Heads pretty regularly. They've got tens of thousands of followers, and I always get a pretty pretty nice little bump from them when I shoot for them. Their stuff tends to be a little more on the grungy and sexy side than you know the predominantly high fashion side of things. Um, but a lot of it is just, like I said, it's style based because each each publication has its own its own thing, its own aesthetic, um, and the biggest biggest way to annoy them is to submit stuff to them that's not relevant to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Melissa, you had mentioned um, putting together a cohesive story in an H eight page piece. Can you can you talk about conceptualizing a shoot and, and give advice to people of how to approach that? Sure. Um, you know fashion is, fashion photography is about you know it's about storytelling. So it's important to have a story that you're shooting that has, you know, I mean, if I get assigned a 10-page editorial, I actually will shoot, try to shoot like 12 or 14 looks so that we can like weed down, but, you know, it could be anything independent, it's usually seasonal, but it could be, you know, um, metallic bathing suits or it could be um, a sweater story and you have, you know, 12 different sweaters that you're going to feature that will be accessorized and put with either skirts or pants, jeans, whatever that look is and, and like you, you figure out, like you look at the clothing that you're shooting and obviously if it's, um, you know, as a and I dresses, you're not going to put that in the, in the forest or, you know, on the, you know, you're not going to put that in like a, like on a hay in a, in a country western themed type set. You're going to want to shoot that probably in a studio with, you know, very directional lighting. So it really depends on like 
you can either start from the from your your concept, like you want to do a fairy tale, you know, um, Little Red Riding Hood story. You found this great forest, and you want to do a story in there, and then you build the clothes into that, depending on when it's going to be published. What clothing you would use? If it's going to be spring fashion, and you're going to do this Little Red White Riding Hood like spring fashion bent, or if it's going to be fall, so you can use a lot of heavy coats, and you just build it from there. And it can be, you know, you can take any idea, any dream, anything you are inspired by and build a story on it. It could be a song, it could be a book you're reading, it could be a visual you saw, it could be anything. I mean, when you, you shoot eight, for eight twelve pages. When you shoot for a for a, a magazine like Harper's Bazaar and you get the creative brief from them, do, do you have a pretty wide latitude for that story or are you working with an art director who says this is how I want to do it? Every editorial, every magazine is different, so they may, I, I may not have, say, I may, they may give me like a couple of choices with models and say, which one do you like best? I might get that much. Uh, some of them give me full latitude um, with the model selection, the casting. Um, but normally they have the location, like a magazine like Harper's has the location picked out, unless like, one time Harper's came, twice Harper's came to LA and they asked me to help with locations. They told me what they were looking for, like a house with a pool, which we did the men's fashion one year there at, at a house with a pool and I found the house that had a pool. But most of the time like when I shoot for them, they have the location picked out and the, the clothes are all done by them. The editor, fashion editor gets the clothes. But I have, I have a hand, or I, I have a, my part is that I will go around the location that we're shooting in and I will come up with shot ideas and then show them and then we'll shoot them that way. That makes gotcha. sense. We're talking with Melissa Rodwell and Dana Pennington from Breed. Uh, we have an offer if you joined us a little bit late. If you go to jointhebreed.com slash photoshelter and sign up for their newsletter at the end of this uh, webinar we're going to pick one of those emails and give you a one-year membership to Breed. Uh, that has great content on fashion photography. Dana, how much um, how much latitude is there to negotiate rates when you're dealing with a commercial shoot versus an editorial shoot? Is is editorial work pretty much preset by the publication in terms of rates? Um, yeah, the few that actually have you know a rate, it's a lot of them is a set rate. Um, and honestly, if you're you're not shooting editorial to make money because it's the budgets just aren't what they used to be. Um, the the big thing, the big benefit to shooting editorials is is like Melissa said before, it's free. It's essentially free advertising. Um, most of the small magazines, a lot of them don't have any any budget. You know, they're barely covering their printing costs or you know their website, you know, upkeep and their servers and all that stuff. Um, but as far as the, on the commercial end goes, um, yeah, it's it's uh, there's a lot more. Uh, negotiation room there's and a lot of it is kind of where you place your value um, in terms of you know what, what your day rate is what you're charging for usage and for stuff like that you know it's it's very different from person to person and it's kind of a it's a little bit of a gray area because you you don't want to be that guy who's underbidding everybody but you also don't want to overbid something and not get a job for it um, so a lot of it is just kind of Assessing, starting with assessing what the client, potential client's budget is, um, and going from there. Um, we have a question in regards to developing your own style, and I know with someone like Terry Richardson, where it's it's obvious even to the layperson, you know, the camera on flash against a white background is his style. But what does it mean to to you, Melissa, to develop style in a more subtle? way how does one do that what what do what are the steps and, and what does it mean to have kind of a unique style in fashion photography um, I mean like you said with Terry Richardson he shoots on camera flash against a white background and that's his sort of signature style so your style is dictated by the way you light and the the editorial that you want published or that you show to the public that's got the style that you like. Like I like very high fashion and I like things that are a little bit darker and more 
gothic, I suppose, and a lot of rock and roll themes. So that's my style. That's what how I fine tooth what. Like if I have creative latitude in a fashion editorial, I'm going to shoot that style so that it's like I'm exposing myself that way all the time. That that's how I like to shoot. That's my style. It's informed by the way you light. It's informed by the stylus that you used and the shoots and how the the fashion is styled and how it's um, this whole overall shoot is executed. You don't see in my portfolio, you know, girls, you know, five blonde girls running down the beach in pink bikinis with a beach ball and a Dalmatian. That's lifestyle, and I don't want to shoot lifestyle. Right. I'll I'll you know, be happy to get a lifestyle gig if it lands on my lap, but I'm not going to market myself to people like Target or Kohl's because they're not my, that's, that's not my niche, right? So that's not in my book. I don't shoot lifestyle, therefore it's not in my book. Or, you know, the girls in the car laughing and smiling and uh, having a, a, great, a great time with an ice cream cone. That's just not my, that's not what I'm interested in shooting. And that's a style. That's not to say that my my way of shooting is better than that way. It's just that I prefer to shoot more um, elaborate, beautiful, very couture-looking clothes type fashion. There, <laughs> there obviously are visual trends. I didn't, I didn't trends. say that very eloquently, but you know. <laughs> there are visual trends that we see whether they're lighting styles or lighting modifiers or retouching styles, do, do you ever feel compelled to change your style just to be sort of contemporary? Or do you think that the value of developing a style is that that's how you shoot? I feel like it took me a while to figure out what my style was because um, <clears throat> I started out in LA, which was not the best city to start out to, to do this in, but I did, and I was always sort of told my work was too weird or too avant-garde, so I was always trying to like bring it, bring it down a notch, and, you know, lower it down, like quiet it to the so the masses would would like my work. <clears throat> so for years, I was sort of all over the place. I had the sort of edgy European editorial look mixed in with the girls on the white seamless. Looking back, I wouldn't have done that. I would have stuck to my to my vision and just shot how I wanted to shoot. But um, I forgot what the question is. Sorry. Yeah, whether you whether you feel compelled to change your style over time. No, not now. I don't. Yeah. No, no, I'm too old. To <laughs> 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 set my ways, change my style. Now I just want to keep fine toothing that and. You know, um, I do get bored with like I go in. I do go in phases. Like I, I love the studio. I love the studio. But then I'll get bored, and I'll be like, you know, after a year of shooting only in the studio, I'll be like, nah, I want to go do some trippy locations. So then it'll be all about locations. And then I'll get bored with that because it's more of a hassle to shoot on location. Yeah. You definitely have more control in the studio. Then I'll be back in the studio. But other than that, I like my style, and I'm gonna stick with it. Dana, we've seen so many instances of of uh, photoshopping, uh, photoshopping accidents, or just photoshopping before <laughs> and afters, um, mm -hmm. which which again to the layperson makes you think, well, what's the skill involved with fashion photography? Maybe I should just really get good at Photoshop. What's your take on retouching and the importance to the photographer? Um, it's. It's a slippery slope. Um, it's just part of the world that we live in now. Um, so I'm not going to say I'm I'm not against it in any way, shape, or form. I, I have completely embraced the digital workflow and in, in my shooting. Um, but I think I think being being able to rein it in and not go over the top with it. Um, Clean images are still important to have. I mean, you don't, you don't. Nobody wants to wind up on one of those like Photoshop fails websites. Yeah. Um, you know, missing missing limbs and weird stuff like that is is not a good look for anybody. But um, I think for some people, it's it's easy to get carried away with it. I think a lot of it is it's sort of. I think everything with fashion photography goes back to having a style. And, and using it as a tool um, to achieve what you want as opposed to using it as a crutch. Um, I still think the, the fundamentals of photography are, are absolutely necessary because um, 
you can you can kind of only only polish a turd so much. You know yeah. what I mean? It's you you have to start from a, a good base image and build upon it as opposed to just going in with a mentality of like, oh, well, this sucks, but I can fix it later, so it's not a big deal. Um, I just think that's a little bit lazy and unprofessional. Um, so using it using it to complement your work and, and take it to the next level as opposed to relying on it solely. We have uh, a bunch of marketing questions, so it's a good time to flip to this marketing slide here first. And I guess we'll start with you, Dana. Social media, how important for emerging fashion photographers? You mentioned Instagram as, as a way to have followers and as a discovery mechanism. How, what do you think that the time should be that photographers allocate to social media? Um, I would say in today's world, a fair amount of time. I, I mean, if I'm sitting at my desk, like yesterday, I spent almost all day retouching, and every so often I would, you know, I would check my phone and, and you know, respond to a comment on Instagram or, or you know, like a couple pictures. I think it's it's crucial now. Um, actually, I can I don't think it's crucial. I know it's crucial. Um, I've I've literally sat down with clients, and one of the first questions people ask now is, "What's your social following like?" Um, so spending time on Instagram, having you know a Tumblr is good. I, I personally like. I really focus on Instagram and Tumblr. I've kind of moved away from Facebook uh, just because it seems like nobody sees anything anybody posts anymore. <laughs> um, but it's we live in it in a 24-hour cycle now, so it's you just kind of have to be on it. It's just part of it. But the nice thing is that things like Instagram and Tumblr they don't take a ton of time and they don't take they don't cost any money. Uh, so you really owe it to yourself t to actually do it um, and engage with people and and be active on it. Melissa, you had the premier fashion blog prior to starting Breed. If somebody was yeah. starting out today, would you encourage them to blog? Is there still value in that? I'm not sure. I think what Dana said is is uh, probably more accurate for when you're starting out is to mm -hmm. really build your like I, and you know I agree with him on Instagram and Tumblr um, because he's right. I mean, I even I had lunch with a, a booker from Wilhelmina recently who said that uh, clients are now booking models not really based on if their look is appropriate for the job, but how many Instagram followers they have, which it's is crazy. Uh, Crazy to me. Yes, it is. It's, I've seen a lot of changes in the 30 years that I've been doing this, and that that just seems that blew my mind when he told me that. So I, <laughs> um, and I don't agree with it, but it doesn't matter whether I agree with it or not. It, it is the uh, it is the way that things are are moving towards now, and and that's that, you know. So I, I don't know. I mean, if you're going to have a, any of this, it takes work. It takes time to get the name out there. Um, when I started the blog in 2008, in 2008, I, my ex did all of the marketing and pushed it. I mean, he was on the internet 24 hours a day doing it. He, you know, he had a love for it and he wanted to get my name out there and he was happy to do that. But unless you've got that kind of time, passion, desire to sit on a blog and really push it like that, I would say do Instagram and Tumblr I think is better. You mentioned... Facebook, I think there's value in... I mean, I, I, I have actually sold an image to Dell computers based on a Facebook thing. So, mm -hmm. and I still think there's value in Facebook, but it's everybody's different. Everyone has their favorite way of getting their work out there. So. Melissa, you said when you were starting out, 16 by 20 portfolios were all the rage. Uh, yeah. And now people have iPad portfolios and some people just walk in with their phone. What 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 is the expectation of agencies and uh, commercial buyers nowadays with portfolios. You know, every, again, everybody's different. I um, there there are still some advertising clients that will want to see a print portfolio, but they're, they're not really insisting on it anymore. The iPad, I use the iPad now for as a portfolio when I go in to see clients, advertising clients, magazine clients can just look at your website. Yeah. But um, when I go in to see an advertising client, I'll take my iPad, and they're fine with that now. And it's great for me because schlepping around that print portfolio, I mean, my portfolio is 50 pages. It's heavy. It's a lot of work <laughs> and all that. Plus, it's expensive to keep updating, you know, keep the prints going and all that. You know, we used to have to have three or four portfolios um, back in the day, and it's costly. So I am all for the iPad. 
Dana, as as a emerging photographer, what sort of marketing do you do? I, you know, in the olden days, we would send out postcards to to buyers and editors. Have you had any successful marketing campaigns? Um, for me, I mean, I actually, I literally, I just finished sending out uh, some promo cards, so we'll see how that goes. But for me, the big thing has been um, social marketing. You know as much as I hate it because I'm a total introvert, but getting out there and actually meeting people um, and getting in front of people has, has worked really well for me. You know, if people, if any of the listeners are in a place like Los Angeles or New York or Miami where there's, you know, there's industry parties, there's agency parties, there's magazine parties, it's, a, it's kind of a drag, but it's worth going to them uh, because you never know who you might meet. Um, and the other, the other thing that's really worked for me, honestly, has been engaging on social media um, and even just reaching directly out. I mean, there have been publications that I've wanted to shoot for um, that I, you know, didn't previously have any contact with, and I've just emailed them and kind of solicited to them and and had some luck with that. But I think I think nothing, just like with any other business form, nothing is better than word of mouth and, and getting your face in front of people. Um, for as far as for like bigger commercial clients goes, it's you know time will tell, I guess. Hopefully. Yeah. But uh, I think I think the big thing is just you have to be able to be willing to put yourself out there. Um, you know, I've talked to a lot of photographers, and they all say they they've stressed the importance of personal projects. In, in a lot of cases, because it's good for the soul. You know, it helps them explore different ideas they have in their head. And Melissa, you talked about photographing musicians and enjoying that. Uh, I guess this is more of a business question. Does does personal work has it translated into paid work for you? Um, sure. Yeah, it has. I mean, I've done you know ex exhibits and I've done themed exhibits and um, yeah, I've gotten calls for ad work through the type of exhibits I've done. Like I did a, an exhibit on young men uh, six or seven years ago that traveled a bit and uh, yeah it got me work it got me great exposure but it, it also it did keep me I'm very inspired to shoot and just sort of keeps you you know as long as you're staying inspired and you're you, you keep shooting I think that's the, the key there um, but I think it's all I mean and a lot of times um, when I go in to see ad agencies they want to know what I'm shoot what I what I want to shoot they want to yeah. know like what I'm shooting on the side for my own personal interests yeah they're interested in that and they like seeing that personal work how how important is it to have an agent or be associated with an agency to be a successful fashion photographer it's very important unless you've got just you know, there's only 24 hours in a day, you know, we've got, Dana just talked about social, using social media to get your name out there, and then we have to shoot, and we have to post process, and we have to find clients, I mean, there's just so much that you can do in a day, uh, unless you really enjoy marketing yourself and staying on top of it, it's, it's really important to have an agent that's sort of do, only doing that and trying to get you work, you know, it's good to have a, it's great to have a great agent. Not so great to have them. <laughs> have Have you found that the expectation of the of the agent has changed over time? I've talked to some photographers who say, you know, they used to do a lot of marketing for you. Now they expect you to come to the table and and say, these these are the marketing efforts I'm going to do as a photographer. What are you going to do as the agency? Or is that not so true yeah, in fashion? Whole, no, it's totally it's totally changed. When I started out, you know, I was lucky enough where agencies would look at a young photographer or emerging photographer and want to and like want to develop them and now there's so many photographers agents are only interested in photographers that are already somewhat either being being published consistently or starting to get in paid work where the agents can sort of jump in and, and market them easier it's easier to market a photographer who's already being published or already working than it is for somebody brand new so yeah. the game has changed. They're not they're not grooming photographers like they used to, and like taking them in and developing their career and helping them guide them and building their portfolios. They now want you to have your social media up and and you know already getting paid gigs and already being you know published in rather decent magazines. 
So Dana, if I'm starting off today, I'm a 22-year-old kid just out of art school. I want to be in fashion photography. Where do I have to be and what should I start doing tomorrow? Um, the first thing that you should start doing is just start shooting. Um, you know, people that are coming out of school are lucky that they have, you know, they've pro if they went to school for specifically for photography, they've probably built up some sort of body of work. Um, for me, I, I moved to Los Angeles nine months ago. Prior to that, I was living in Denver and I would travel, you know, every other month or so for like a week or two weeks. Um, and being in a fashion market, I put fashion in kind of air quotes because it, it is Los Angeles, but um, is has done more for me in the past eight months than the past three years of me since I've started shooting. Um, so you just have you have to be willing to live in New York or Los Angeles or or Miami if your style fits Miami. Um, Miami is kind of a weird market. Um, for fashion, it's a weird market in general. But the big thing for me has been moving to a fashion market. That way, I can, you know, when you're, if you're living in Cleveland or you know Dallas or something like that, you're only going to be able to shoot so much, um, and you're only going to be able to progress so far. Uh, being a, the big fish in a small pond is, is not a great long-term strategy. Um, if you really want to be working in the the fashion industry, you you need to be in in New York or Paris or you know a major fashion market uh, because you're going to be able to hone your craft that much better and you'll progress infinitely faster um, both technically and career wise. A lot of people will move to a place like New York and immediately start trying to assist a big name photographer. What's the value in assisting and do you think that's a viable career path to becoming your own photographer? Absolutely. It's great mm -hmm. advice. I, it, if you were to ask me the same question you asked Dana, I would say move to New York and try to assist for a very established photographer. You're going to learn a lot, plus you're, you're just in the mix of things, of you know, the clients that they're shooting for and um, the people that you're going to meet through assisting them. It's great. It's a great education. It's very difficult to get in with a big shooter like Mizell or you know, Martin Marcus, but um, you can work your way up. Just start... I mean, if you're just fresh out of school, you need to, like Dana said, move to a city like LA or New York, and get a, you know, align yourself with people that are already established or shooting. Whether it's you know interning for them or just meet, try to meet with them and try to uh, get in and do something with them and assist, start assisting. Yeah, a case in point. Look at uh, Alexei Lubomirsky. He started his career working for Mario Testino, and now he's shooting for Vanity Fair and huge publications that most of us can only ever dream of working for. Um, yeah. It's absolutely accurate. Yeah. Um, let me see if there's uh, some other questions here. Um, here's, here's one question. You sort of alluded to it, Dana, but what, what is the difference between Miami and New York and L.A.? <laughs> um, you Miami... <laughs> Miami is, first of all, uh, one thing that you really have to consider with Miami is that Miami is seasonal. Um, there are certain times of the year, like a few weeks ago, the weather in Miami really sucks um, and everybody kind of leaves town. So that's, that's one thing that you really have to consider if you're considering living and working in Miami. Um, and the style there is much more commercial. Um, it's, and so you're either going to, in Miami, you're either going to get cute commercial, like people smiling and hanging out, or it's swimwear. Um, those are the two big things that, that are in Miami. If you want to shoot high fashion type stuff, I would just cross Miami off your list unless you're dying to live in South Florida for some ungodly reason. <laughs> what? No offense to my family in Florida. I, I have, I, and I, I did. I lived in Miami for a while. I spent quite a bit of time there. Um, and it's just it it's very specific market for very specific styles and it just doesn't it's not me so I'm not crazy about it but the people that do like it love it um, it's, yeah, it's with I Miami it's either a love hate I lived there for 18 months and um, I loved living there but I didn't get any work I had to fly to New York and LA all the time <laughs> <laughs> so. that's yeah that's pretty much how it goes with Miami yeah. so 
you know, uh, Danny, you said you started off in photojournalism, and and when I speak to photojournalists, a lot of them say, "Hey, we're not we're not actually making all our money in in photojournalism. We do these commercial gigs on the side." Melissa, is it possible to make a living strictly shooting editorial in fashion nowadays, or do you have to have no. commercial? No, there's they don't pay the magazines don't pay anymore. Yeah, I mean some of them do, but uh, they don't pay. You can't get enough of those gigs to to pay your rent. So editorial really is a marketing exposure, as you mentioned at the top of the the seminar, the webinar. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I, yes, it is. That's why I do it still, and then you know I'll shoot for these magazines with no budget because it gets my name out there. But there is no, um, there's no, there. I can't pay my rent with editorial. And so when you to. are hired to shoot commercial, mm -hmm. you're being hired for the style that you're showing in the editorial, or do they try to tweak it to to match the brand? Both. I mean, I've shot a Nike gig, which wasn't really my style, but they liked my work and they liked how I shoot. And, you know, they wanted someone creative for the job. So, and my style, I guess, is a little edgy and stands out, so they wanted that. So my style did get me work, but I didn't shoot the job in my style. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. And Dana, as the, as the new guy on the block, what are you finding? How are you paying the bills? Um... It's doing whatever you can, honestly. When you're when you're starting out, you really have to hustle. Um, shooting things like lookbooks, um, I do paid model testing, um, which by itself I don't think is is a viable you know career plan. But when you when you throw in you know a couple tests in a week and then a lookbook at, you know each month, you you can make it happen. Um, but those are probably the two big things for me right now is lookbooks. Uh, lang sheets and and testing paid testing before we announce the winner of the one year uh, membership to join the breed uh, I actually wanted to end on a fun note are there what are cliches in fashion photography that you would say never shoot these types of things anything come mm -hmm. to mind right away Melissa never shoot these types of things are there are there poses or or certain outfits where you think these are just taboo nobody wants to look at that <laughs> or there are just too many to mention. Oh yeah, you don't want to get me started, really. <laughs> <laughs> you can stay at this. I, I think that um, what I'm seeing. I'll just say this real quick. From what I'm seeing, um, when I started out, you know, years and years ago, it was really important to understand and have a strong knowledge in the history of fashion and fashion design. And from what I'm seeing, the young Photographer is shooting now. It's a tank top, a pair of cut-off shorts, and a girl leaning against a beat-up car and a pair of Doc Martens. Yeah, I see that over and over and over again. So I think what the what's sorely missing in a lot of the young emerging photographers is their, you know, a, an eye for fashion and an understanding of how to shoot fashion because that's what we are. You know, we are fashion photographers, and that's what I think is missing. And um, yeah, I don't know. Model 101 poses, I, you know, we we're all tired of seeing that too, but that just goes hand in hand when you're starting out. You sure, know. sure. It'll Dana, any, any, any big ones for you, Dana? Um, I, no, no cliches, but I will kind of piggyback off of what Melissa just said. Is It's kind of, and I'll pose it as sort of an interesting, I'm going to play the devil's advocate a little bit because it is an interesting catch-22 in, in the world that we live in today. Um, nobody doubts that that sex sells, um, and you see a lot of emerging photographers, and their their work tends to be start off on the, the sexier side of things. I think a lot because it's easier to do, it's more accessible, um, and that's a great way to gain a social following because people like scrolling through their newsfeed and seeing hot chicks. But it's there's not really a whole lot of you know career to be made out of that. Um, so the one thing that I would I would tell people to do is you you like Melissa said you really do have to start shooting clothes and and I I say this and I to myself just as much as I'm saying it to anybody else because I'm guilty of it as well um, but it it really is you do need to to find a way to make it about the fashion and not just about you know beautiful models whether they're male or female um, you you have to translate it to something that's commercially viable. With that, we have the winner of the one-year annual membership 
I have it on my phone here. I don't know if you have it, Dana. Do you want to announce it? I don't have it. I'll oh, let you okay. do the honors. All right. Well, Darren Moriarty, you have won the uh, the membership. Congratulations, Darren. And and uh, Breed will be emailing you with the details on that. Yay! Clap clap clap. Yay. <laughs> Hey guys, thank you so much for uh, for joining cool. us today. A lot of uh, great insight, uh, Melissa and Dana. Yeah. Um, time well spent. This po uh, uh, webinar will be available uh, for you to watch in case you missed any of it, or you want to, you know, l watch it in slow motion uh, on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. Probably be up in the next 24 hours. But I want to thank my guests one more time, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Hope to see you on the next broadcast. Uh, and so for Dana and Melissa, this is Alan Murabayashi signing off. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.